um, so I'm recording it now. Um, and so if you are interested in watching this again, um, it will be posted on the past seminar page in a few days. And I'm putting that link into the chat now. So you have it if you would like it. Um, and um, yeah, a couple of things. I rattled myself by not starting to record, but I'm back. Here we go. Um, just want to make an announcement for next week. We have um, Amy Lang, who's from NOAA's Southwest Fishery Science Center, will be talking about the insight to the population structure of gray whales using genetics. So if you're interested in that, same place, same time next week on um, June 10th come back for that one. Um, if you are interested in any of Hatfield's events, you can go to our homepage, scroll to the bottom, and there's a calendar of events there where you can get all the information you need and the links to join us. I also wanted to let folks know I've got about four more days left for summer seminar. So if anybody is interested in speaking to the Hatfield community or wants to recommend somebody else, unlike what's happened today, uh, please feel free to reach out to me and we'll get those individuals on our seminar schedule. But for today, um, our speaker was invited by Will White. So Will White, would you like to do our introductions? Yes, great, thank you, Cinnamon. Uh, it's really my pleasure to introduce Malin Pinsky. Uh, I've known him for many years and it's a real pleasure to have him uh, speaking to us. Uh, Malin is an associate professor at the Department of Ecology, Evolution and Natural Resources at Rutgers. Uh, and he's been at Rutgers uh, since 2013. Uh, prior to that, he did a postdoc uh, at Princeton University and then he got his PhD at, uh, at Stanford and in the, at the uh, Hopkins Marine Lab. Um, Malin is a very prolific and talented marine ecologist. Uh, he began his career uh, in his PhD uh, working with the population ecology and population genetics of anemone fish. Uh, and he still works on that. In fact, he published a paper on that just uh, a few months ago. Uh, but since then, he's really moved on to thinking a lot about questions related to uh, the effect of uh, the changing climate on marine populations and especially marine fisheries. Uh, so he's published some of the seminal papers on how species are shifting their geographic ranges in the ocean in response to climate warming and other types of uh, climate variability, um, and has done a, a growing amount of work showing how uh, humans should respond to those changes. How should we manage our fisheries? How should we conserve species uh, in the face of this, this rapid global change? Um, I said he was prolific. He's published something like 83 papers. He's been cited over 5,000 times, uh, and these are not like uh, 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 low profile papers. These are in uh, Nature and Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. So really um, a, a very influential uh, contributor to the field. Uh, and it's no surprise that other people have noticed that and he's been recognized for the number of awards. He was a uh, Sloan Research Fellow, a Cavley Fellow with the National Academy of Sciences, received an Early Career Award from uh, ICES, uh, and an uh, Early Career Fellow uh, at the Ecological Society of America. So he's a very notable member of the field. and. Um, I should say he's also just a really nice person who's very generous with his time and I'm really sorry that he can't be here in person because it'd be, it'd be great just to uh, have a beer and chat with him. Um, but um, Malin, it's a real pleasure to have you. Uh, Hatfield is very fortunate to have you speaking to us today and I'm looking forward to seeing what you have to say. Thanks so much, Will. Uh, and thanks so much for the invitation to speak today. And I also want to thank Cinnamon for helping organize everything. Uh, it's been I think it's been more than 10 years and I have very fond memories of walking over the road brewery after talks. I wish uh, we could be doing that, Will and others, uh, after this talk, but uh, not this time. As Will mentioned, we've, we've known each other for a long time and actually the paper that we came out just this winter on reef fish population, metapopulation dynamics um, was with Will. It's really been a fun collaboration linking empirical work with genetics and, uh, and theory. I'm actually not going to be talking about the reef fish uh, work today, though I'm happy to address any of that in, in questions. And as I get started, started, I also want to acknowledge with respect to uh, Lenny Lenape people in whose traditional territory I currently sit. So the world is filled with an incredible diversity of species, from microbes to plants, insects to birds, squids to people. But all of these species have to survive in an environment that varies strongly through time and space, whether that's temperature, water, nutrients, light. Some of the fascinating question, questions include how, where, when, and whether a population or species can persist with this environmental variation. It's also a time of rapid environmental change, whether that's temperature over the last 150 years, as I'm showing you here, or the many other aspects of global change. 
And a major challenge that I see for biologists is to understand the relevant processes well enough to predict the consequences for species and ecosystems going forward. So on, on one level, organisms have an amazing diversity of ways to cope with environmental change. A certain amount is tolerable just from a physiological point of view. But beyond that, behavior allows organisms to avoid stressful conditions, while acclimation and plasticity allow for changes in tolerance over slightly longer timescales. And over generations, evolution can rescue a population faced with extirpation. If conditions in one location are unsuitable, an alternative is expansion into new territory with more suitable conditions. And if none of these mechanisms are successful, extinction is the result. And on top of this, we aren't just talking about a single species, but entire communities of species. So changing interactions among those species can feed back to affect any of these processes. We can think of these mechanisms as spread across axes of time, space, and biological organization, from individual organisms to populations to communities. And while our understanding at each level has been improving rapidly, we have an integrated knowledge across these biological scales very well. If we want to know what, for example, climate change means for species geographic distributions and global survival, those are emergent patterns from a very complex system. And one of the interesting and very consistent lessons from complex system science is that these emergent patterns typically cannot be inferred simply from the behavior of its components. So understanding will require both working up from the small scale details and mechanisms, as well as working down from the emergent patterns to understand how processes work across biological scales. So one of the earlier efforts to pull these threads together was motivated by, by this question. How easily can animals cross mountain passes? And Dan Jameson's answer had a lot to do with this graph, where we've got seasonality on the vertical axis, just the standard deviation of monthly temperatures across latitude on the x-axis from the southern hemisphere to the equator to the northern hemisphere. Seasonality is high towards the poles, but low at the equator. And as Jansen conjectured, species that have evolved in the tropics can only tolerate a narrow range of temperatures. And so moving over a cold mountain pass should be relatively more difficult. Mountain passes are in effect higher in the tropics. So Josh Tewksbury and colleagues then turn this around to argue that tropical ectotherms are also the most sensitive to future warming. Again, because they have this narrow tolerance range. And that's been a provocative idea. It sparked plenty of really interesting ongoing research. But note that this is just a discussion and debate across latitudes on land. So let's now dip our heads under the ocean surface. It's an environment with strikingly different physical conditions, evolutionary history, geographic patterns, even histories of human interactions. And these contrasts provide a fascinating opportunity to test ecological and evolutionary theory and to understand the impacts of climate change on ecosystems. So throughout the rest of my talk, I want to explore some of these differences. On one level, we're talking about a very deep diversity in the ocean, 33 animal phyla compared to 12 on land. Species in these environments live in very different fluids. The specific heat of water is four times higher than air. The ocean's also very big, about 1.3 sextillion liters to be somewhat precise. So one consequence is that there's been more warming on land shown in these orange and red lines, about a degree and a half, compared to the three quarters of a degree in the ocean in blue. Though the ocean warming that has happened is quite substantial compared to the temperature variation species in these different environments experience. So if we again plot seasonality on the vertical axis across latitudes on the horizontal axis, we have the land surface in green, ocean surface in blue. We see a qualitatively different pattern in the ocean, but also about six times less temperature variation across seasons. It's also less spatial variation in temperature in the ocean than on land. So an organism can duck into the shade or move into the sun to change body temperature relatively easily on land, but there are fewer opportunities for that in the ocean. There's also some interesting differences in abundance. So apparently the domesticated chicken is the most abundant vertebrate on land with 
an astounding 20 billion chickens around the world, some of which wear uh, sweaters. But that's nothing in comparison to certain species of mesopelagic fishes that are four orders of magnitude more abundant. And that high abundance has implications for evolution. Natural selection should be relatively more effective and genetic drift very weak. You can also look at movement. While most of us, me included, find it harder to swim than to run, for organisms evolved in these environments, it's the opposite. It takes eight times more energy to run on land a given distance than it does to swim in the water. A lot of that has to do with buoyancy. So in other words, marine animals have greater mobility than do species on land, including at their larval stages when they're you know, a bit more like wind dispersed seeds. Finally, the, the last point I wanna make is that the timeline of human impacts in these two environments is also quite different. On land, we've seen this dominant cause of extinction transition from direct hunting of animals to the transformation of habitat. But in the ocean, these trends are much further behind. We began hunting whales at a large scale a couple hundred years ago, industrial fishing, largely a mid 20th century invention. And habitat transformation is still concentrated in relatively small local areas. So what do these differences mean for the impacts of climate change and global change across these different realms? What are the most important ecological and evolutionary processes driving these changes? And how do they differ across realms and, and taxa? Broadly, this is what my research focuses on, the ecology and evolution of, of global change. I just wanna say that the research I'll be talking about today wouldn't be possible without the hard work and collaboration of many in this photo over the last few years. I've been especially excited about the chance to engage undergraduates in research from a diversity of backgrounds. And I think those early research experiences are a really important way to foster inclusion within the sciences. I just wanna acknowledge their contributions before I get started. For today's talk, I specifically wanna focus on four questions. How does sensitivity to warming differ across terrestrial and marine species? Do differences in sensitivity scale to population and community responses? When is rapid evolution important? And how might conservation adapt to the changes that are happening? So on this first question, it's useful to think in terms of a thermal performance curve that maps out how fitness varies across temperatures, often especially useful for ectotherms. We have a minimum temperature species can survive as well as an upper thermal limit. And the specific physiological mechanisms that set these limits often differ among species, but they often involve metabolic rates, oxygen and food supplies, as well as protein structures or membrane fluidity of cells. And thermal safety is a metric uh, for an organism's tolerance for warming. So it's the difference between the body temperature an organism experiences and the upper thermal limit. So we wanna compare marine and terrestrial thermal safety margins. We can first focus on this upper limit. So what we did is we compiled data from physiological experiments that measured that upper thermal limit for nearly 320 species on land and about 90 species in the ocean, focusing in particular on adult data and accounting for differences in experimental conditions like acclimation temperatures. And this graph shows the upper thermal limit on the y-axis. Each dot is a speed from a study. The smooth fit is from a generalized additive mixed effects model. We have terrestrial species on the left, marine species on the right. And one thing we see is this relatively greater drop in that upper physiological tolerance towards high latitudes in the ocean compared to what we see on land. The other part of a thermal safety margin is body temperature. We, know it's also, we also know it's not the average body temperature that's most important, but actually that extreme high temperature that's most stressful and problematic. So we therefore, we therefore focused on the extreme high temperatures an organism is likely to experience in each location where these studies were conducted. I will say that calculating body temperatures on land is a bit tricky. It's not the same as air temperatures because solar radiation, convection from wind, conduction to the surface are all important, as well as behavior and organisms' ability to seek refuge in cooler parts of the landscape. What I'm about to show you, therefore, are calculations from a microclimate model that's been run hourly for 20 years for a shady habitat at the location each animal was collected. 
What we find here now is shown here in orange. Again, the dots are for each species. The orange line is extreme high body temperatures in the shade across latitudes, just as that latitudinal average. If we zoom in a bit though, we see some interesting patterns. And in particular, it seems like there are two peaks in extreme hot body temperatures. The black line here is the best fit. The gray lines are samples from the parameter uncertainty of that fit. And even across that uncertainty though, nearly all lines have two peaks as shown by this histogram, showing the number of samples with one, two, three, or four peaks. And this, and this other histogram shows where those peaks occur. We see they're above and below the equator rather than right at it. Turns out the hottest hours are actually at intermediate latitudes where long summer days heat up the most and also where low humidity allows for larger daily temperature swings. And we see similar patterns, again, two peaks on either side of the equator, when we look at upper thermal tolerance limits as well. So in other, in other words, the latitudinal pattern of extreme temperatures is reflected in the thermal limits that ectotherms have evolved. I think it's really interesting. I will say it's quite a bit easier to do these calculations for marine species. Convection and conduction are quite rapid and we use water temperatures as a proxy for body temperatures. So we can now plot upper thermal limits in black, extreme high body temperatures uh, in orange for both terrestrial and marine species. And these are the data we need for calculating thermal safety margins. It's the difference between these two for each, each species. So what I'm showing you here is the thermal safety margin on the y-axis, again, across latitudes on the x-axis. We've got terrestrial in green, marine in blue. Each dot is a species. Average, or averages are those lines. And I see two key takeaways. So first on land, we see the slimmest thermal safety on average, not at the equator has been, as has been suggested before, but actually at 20 to 30 degrees north and south suggesting that it's these species and actually not those at the equator that are most sensitive to further warming. Second, we see less thermal safety across all latitudes in the ocean compared to what we see on land. And we can look at projections of extreme temperatures into the future, shown here for a high greenhouse gas emission scenario, while also accounting for differences in the ability of marine and terrestrial species to acclimate. There are some interesting differences. We still, though, see less thermal safety for marine species across latitudes, suggesting that the, the take-home message at the level of these individual organisms is that marine species are more sensitive to warming than our species on land when we account for physiological tolerance, acclimation, and behavior. And I think this is really surprising, especially considering just a decade ago, there was very little attention to climate impacts on marine life, and now we're finding that they're likely the most sensitive. So then the question is, do these differences in sensitivity scale up to differences in population and uh, community responses? So one way to think about this is to start out thinking about a population spread across latitudes. One range edge will be warm, the other cold. And if we go back to that range of mechanisms species use to cope with environmental variation, it's a set of processes that allow a species to persist in place, like tolerance and behavior and acclimation and evolution. They're all important for determining whether that warm range edge persists in place or whether it contracts poleward when environmental temperatures warm up. So given what I just showed you, we might hypothesize that range contractions are more common in marine species. But are they? I just want to start out with an example from the coastline near, near where I am. So in this map, we're looking at the Northeast US continental shelf. We've got Nova Scotia up top, North Carolina down at the bottom. It's a 1,200 kilometer span of ocean. And the areas in red in this map show places with a high density of this species, longhorn sculpin, as recorded by an ecological survey out of Woods Hole, conducted by the uh, NOAA fisheries. Areas without sculpin are in blue. So we can see the southern range limit was off Virginia in the late 1960s, but by 2017, it contracted north to New York, about 300 kilometers away. 
This is during a period of uh, rapid warming in ocean temperatures for the region as well. To look at general patterns, though, we then pulled data from the literature on resurveys of warm range edges in ectothermic animals, focusing in particular on multi-species studies that also included uh, range edges that hadn't moved. So for the 100 or so marine species in the data set, about half had contracted to higher latitudes, while on, only on land, only a quarter had. One explanation could be greater mobility of marine species. On the other hand, if we trim to the 67 marine species with low adult mobility, we still see a bit over half the species contracting towards the poles, suggesting that population extirpation is also an important part of these changes that we're observing, not just sort of low detectability for some of these species. So we're seeing more frequent extirpations at that warm range edge in the ocean. Whether or not that leads to species extinction depends on what happens at the other range edge. In other words, does range expansion occur fast enough? So that brings us to the other really important set of processes by which organisms cope with temperature variation. So to answer questions like this, my research group has focused quite a bit on pulling together a continental scale set of ecological surveys for North America from the last half century. It's been done in very close collaboration with NOAA Fisheries as well as DFO in Canada. Uh, we make these data freely available through a website called Ocean Adapt, oceanadapt.rutgers.edu. And the regions are illustrated by these red polygons from the subarctic Bering Sea to the subtropical Gulf of Mexico to Newfoundland up in the Atlantic. And these are bottom trawl surveys were conducted every year or so by government agencies and their, uh, and their partners. This show, photo shows the back deck of a survey vessel out of, uh, out of Woods Hole. They drop a large net off the back, drag it near the bottom, and then count and weigh the species they pull up. It's everything from familiar species like rockfish and lobster, plus a wide range of other species like whelks and sea anemones. And they, these surveys provide a fantastic record for how species and communities have changed through time. It's also an enormous effort by a large number of people spread all over the country. And that this research wouldn't be possible without, without that, those efforts. And the exciting part is the data that we have uh, rivals in many ways the data we have for species on land. More recently, we've also been expanding this data set globally in collaboration with international partners. So we can then use these surveys to compare the speed at which leading and trailing edges are shifting. So here we're looking across 43 species of fishes in the Northeast US. Uh, we've got rate of shift on the Y axis for either uh, the warm trailing edges or the cold leading edges. This is work led by Alexa Fredston, uh, currently a, a postdoc in my group. And so what we found is that those cold leading edges are expanding almost twice as fast as the warm trailing edges are contracting, 80% faster, suggesting that for many of these species, environmental change actually can be an opportunity for range expansion, not just a threat um, to species. So besides rate, however, there's also a lot of important variation among species in the direction they shift. This is just one example from the Gulf of Alaska for the Harlequin rockfish. And the circle shows the center of the distribution in 1984. And the tip of the arrow shows the center in 2011, again, as recorded by a bottom trawl survey uh, in the Gulf of Alaska from the Alaska Fishery Science Center. So it's a shift to about 700 kilometers in only 27 years. But on the other hand, spiny dogfish, very similar region, barely shifted at all. And across many fishes and invertebrates in the region, we see even more variety. There's a lot of variation in measured rate of shift. <coughs> if we zoom out, we see lots of variation <coughs> both among and within regions of North America. In this particular map, each small colored arrow is a taxon. The large black arrow is the average across species. So to start to make sense of this variety, we can compare these shift in species shown here on the vertical axis in degrees latitude per year 
against the spatial shift in temperatures on the x-axis, so spatial shift in isotherms, again in degrees latitude per year. Each dot here is a taxon within a region, and the red line is the one-to-one -one line. So it would be where, where taxa would fall if they followed shifting temperatures perfectly. Clearly, they don't. Makes sense, given how many factors influence changes in species ranges, including both direct and indirect effects of temperature change. However, it's also striking that we can explain a fair bit of the variation across species based on this spatial shift in temperature. This graph also allows us to ask whether species shift fast enough to keep up with climate. We can do that by noting that all of these species aren't shifting north fast enough. We measure that as the difference from the one-to-one -one line. These species aren't shifting south fast enough, whereas these are actually speeding ahead. If we make a histogram of those comparisons, we actually don't see evidence that marine animals on average are lagging behind. Uh, PhD student Zoe Kitchell, along with an undergrad, Cassiel Padilla, have looked hard at species traits as well. But at least so far, we've only found a small indication that slow growing species are more likely to lag behind. I think what's more striking is that these results contrast so strongly with what we see on land, where species from mammals to butterflies, birds, plants, and trees all appear to be lagging behind climate velocities. And I see two proximate reasons. One is that dispersal is easier in the ocean than on land. So these leading edge range expansions are happening faster. But in addition, marine species are more sensitive to warming, as I showed you at the beginning of the talk. So their trailing edges are also being extirpated at higher rates as well. Together, those lead to faster overall shifts in species distributions in the ocean. Given what we know about past changes, can we forecast future changes? I think this is an exciting area of ongoing research. Um, and especially in the ocean, one of the exciting things is that we have a half century of data to actually test whether our forecasts are any good. I want to briefly mention a couple of approaches we're developing right now. One is a collaboration with computer scientists across applied across 100 species of fishes and 100 species of birds in North America. And what we found is that uh, a number of artificial intelligence deep learning methods um, quite effectively outperform many other sort of more traditional species distribution modeling approaches by quite a bit. One of the challenges though is even though the forecasts may be quite accurate, it's, they're quite challenging to interpret and understand why they're accurate. So the other approach we're developing is actually to go in some ways the exact opposite direction, to get very mechanistic through what are called dynamic range models. It's work that's been led by Jude Kong, who's now faculty at York University, Alexa Fredston, who I mentioned earlier as a postdoc, and as well as Jivanta Bandara, incoming PhD student. And the key idea is to model not species ranges per se, but instead the relationship between environment and demographic rates like growth or reproduction. We then map those rates out across space and time and simulate spatial population dynamics that we then fit with Bayesian methods against size structured abundance observation such as the And as I've showed you, we've got extensive data across time and space, both for fitting as well as testing the forecasts of these models. We're working on near-term forecasts right now, sort of in the one to 10 year range, um, in particular to help aid uh, the fishery management process. It's a collaboration with the Mid-Atlantic Fishery Management Council. So the take home message is that marine and aquatic populations respond rapidly to temperature change, especially uh, at least in the ocean through these processes of extirpation and expansion. And that these responses are often faster than we've observed for species on land. So, so far in this talk, I've touched on individual organismal responses, I've touched on population responses, but I haven't talked about evolution. So, in what cases is evolutionary rescue a viable and important response to rapid environmental changes? So I wanna give you two case studies over the next little bit, next part of the talk. The first is going to be a, a detour away from marine systems 
It's about white nose syndrome. It's a disease affecting and killing many species of bats, especially here in Eastern North America. It's caused by a fungus, Pseudogymnoascus destructans, causes lesions on the wings of the bats and causes mortality primarily by waking bats up during hibernation so that they run through their energy stores and don't make it through the winter. It was first identified in a cave near Albany, New York over a decade ago, presumably from Europe where this disease is endemic and where it's actually not fatal to bats. And white nose has now spread across much of the country. In this particular map, color goes from early records in purple through red in 2019 to 2020. And the effects on species and populations have been dramatic. Population declines up to 95%. So populations that used to be in the hundreds of thousands are now just in the thousands. It's a massive change to the wildlife community. And there are very large concerns about the future of many species of bats in North America. On the other hand, despite these dramatic declines, some populations intriguingly are now increasing. And this red line shows the crash, but also the partial recovery of a population near Albany. We've got years since uh, detection of white nose syndrome here on the x-axis. And this blue line shows that the fungus is still, still present. It's still around, it hasn't disappeared. And these other graphs show recovery or at least stabilization of a few other populations on the East Coast. And some of these trajectories look intriguingly like evolutionary rescue. So it's the case where rapid evolution saves a population from extirpation after environmental change through the evolution of tolerance or other coping mechanisms uh, that allow it to have higher survival or reproduction in the new environment. So to start to answer this question of whether evolutionary rescue is an important part of uh, these recoveries, I wanna present some work led by Sarah Chinu Wolfson when she was a postdoc at Rutgers. So we collected tissue samples from three caves uh, right during the initial white nose infection when most bats died. We also then recollected from three of those caves uh, in the present, including two of the same ones about two generations later. We extracted genomic DNA, and did whole, whole genome low coverage sequencing to look for signals of selection. So we, we look across the bat genome shown here on the x-axis with allele frequency change between the early and the late samples here on the y-axis. Each dot is a single nucleotide polymorphism. So a, uh, a nucleotide in the bat genome, sometimes called a SNP. Uh, and up top, we see some of those SNPs have changed frequency a lot, more than 50% in these two generations. We then used Wright Fisher forward simulations to identify these SNPs that had changed significantly more than would be expected just from drift and uh, the sampling process. So sampling variants. And these SNPs are therefore more likely to be under selection um, over the course of these two generations. And they're shown here in green, a uh, total of 63 SNPs at least using a false detection or cutoff of Simulations also allowed us to estimate selection coefficients, which averaged a very high value of, of 0.8, suggesting widespread soft sweeps from pre-existing genetic variation in these populations. These aren't novel mutations. They already existed in the historical populations, but are now at much higher frequencies. What's especially intriguing are the genes that seem to be involved. We went into this expecting to find genes related to immune function, but instead the, these genes have more to do with weight gain, with brain development and hibernation, suggesting instead that it's hibernation physiology and behavior that's evolving, not immune function. And actually this is consistent with some, at least some anecdotal descriptions of what have been called sleepy bats. So it's bats that don't wake up as much when they're infected with white nose syndrome. And seemingly for that reason are better surviving through the winter. They're not burning through their energy stores. So we're now following up on this uh, to better understand the function of these genes and to link phenotypes 
two genotypes. So the second case study I want to discuss, I'll say right up front, comes to the opposite conclusion. So many species of fish develop earlier, achieve smaller body sizes after being fished. This could be phenotypic plasticity, but much of the literature has concluded that this is rapid evolution called fisheries-induced evolution. Atlantic cod shown here uh, has often been the poster child for fisheries-induced evolution. These are quite literally textbook examples. We have experimental evidence by folks like David Conover that has been very clear. When fish like these silver sides are artificially selected for either large or small sizes, they do evolve in that direction. That is evolution, it's heritable, um, it's a heritable change. And we also know that that experimental evolution produces clear genomic footprints. These graphs show on the y-axis significant allele frequency changes during these experimental evolution uh, trials, specifically of the silver, side, silver sides I showed you in the, in the last slide. And we see uh, large changes in allele frequencies across many different parts of the genome. This is from a paper led by Nina Thurkelton, she, where she tested for these effects in the wild. Uh, tested for these effects, sorry, in these experimental populations. Testing for these effects in the wild, though, has been a lot harder. So that's what we tried to do. We uh, took whole genome resequencing from both historical and contemporary Atlantic cod samples. These were ear bones and scales from archives at uh, government agencies, Department of Fisheries and Oceans in Canada, the Institute of Marine Research in, in Norway. The samples, the historical samples from, were from 1907 in Norway, 1940 in Canada. And then we have modern recollections from the same places in the early 2010s. So if we look at these two populations, we can plot the age of maturity on the y-axis here across, across time. And so we see that in both populations, there've been a quite a dramatic decrease in the age at 50% maturity. These fish are maturing at earlier ages as would be expected from fisheries-induced evolution. Though I will say, intriguingly, there's been some indication of a recovery uh, over the last decade or so in Norway as fishing rates have been relaxed. I think what's especially dramatic, though, is that neither population so shows strong allele frequency shifts uh, anywhere in the genome that we can detect. So the y-axis here is, the, is a genome-wide p-value for a significant shift in allele frequency. We've got a p-value of one at the bottom, 0.05 at the top where this dashed line is, arranged across the genome by chromosome scale linkage groups. And even those regions that come close to showing maybe hint of a significant shift are those that actually have the lowest quality genotypes, low mapping scores, low genotyping qualities. I will say though, we, we can't rule out highly polygenic evolution through very small or undetectable changes in frequency at, at many loci. Uh, that's, that's still possible. Though at least my interpretation of the results is that you know, typically actually seems more likely for the observed changes um, so far. In either case, there has not been an irrevo irreversible loss of genetic variation. So I think that's really inter interesting. So despite all the experimental evidence and the discussion, uh, I think fisheries-induced evolution may actually be rare in the wild. Population sizes are much larger, more heterogeneous. Harvest rates are also much lower than in the lab. And mortality is also much lower than, for example, the white nose syndrome example I showed you earlier or um, the experiments. In the wild selection for traits, uh, like age of maturity is also much less precise. It's much different than the very direct selection on size in say the Conover experiments I showed you earlier. The selection environment is also much more complex in the wild, all, all of which make it difficult, I think, to translate the experimental evidence just directly out into the wild and, and compare them very concretely. So from these, these two disparate 
studies, I think the take home message is that rapid evolution definitely can, but does not always contribute to population survival. And I think more broadly, temporal genomics are a really powerful tool for answering these questions, especially now that we have the genomic tools for answering these questions quite directly. I think that's really exciting. So the final broad topic I'd like to touch on is conservation. Most conservation has been designed for a world that is relatively stable. And yet thermal stresses are outpacing organismal tolerance at many sites and for many species around the world. Um, many of those species are shifting rapidly to new locations. I've shown you some evidence of that today. So given those challenges, which sites should we focus on protecting? So one popular suggestion has been to protect climate refugia. Those areas, like in this example for bison, that are cold and will still be climat climatically suitable for these species in the, in the future. So we were really interested in whether evolution would change that recommendation. So in work led by Tim Walsworth, now uh, at Utah State University, we set up a simple model. It has a string of habitat patches connected by dispersal along a temperature gradient. We have a species with a certain thermal tolerance, a certain thermal performance curve, and living in a world that overall is, is warming. And the question is, where do we place protected areas? So we can actually compare, this is just sort of a toy where we can compare strategies um, based on uh, outcomes in terms of overall species abundance at the end of, end of warming, from low abundance in red to high abundance in blue. Uh, for example, um, if we space protected areas evenly across this gradient, it, you know, it does okay. It's not, not so bad. But placing them at the cold sites down here, so those climate refugia, does the best. At least in a world without evolution. This is a model, so then we can allow, we can sort of turn on evolution. Can allow thermal tolerance to evolve higher or lower, lower based on the local selection, you know, from the local environment, or also from gene flow as individuals disperse among these sites. And what's interesting is that we get the opposite result. So on the right here, we've got protecting cold sites, which now does worse, even with only a very small bit of evolution. And it does a lot worse if there's quite a bit of evolution. Evolution in this case is expressed as the additive genetic variation. So that's just across what I'm showing you across the x-axis here. And strategies that instead, strategies that spread protection across hot, intermediate, and cold sites are now the ones that do the best. They allow gene flow from these pre-adapted hot sites to those future cold refugia. And that process now becomes very important uh, in a conservation strategy. That conservation can facilitate this gene flow, facilitate a high abundance in these pre-adapted sites, and then also conserve these climate refugia in the future. Different kind of conservation strategy is to think about how do we do conservation planning for species that are shifting distributions rapidly. And I'm gonna gloss over some of the details here just in the interest of time, but if we're thinking about ocean planning based only on where species are now, that, that kind of planning will be less likely to meet planning goals in the future because species move out of conservation areas or actually move out of important areas for fishing. And this graph shows that decline in planning goals that are met for conservation or fishing. We've got year on the, on the x-axis, fraction of goals met on the y-axis. And we've done this not just for one region, but for nine, reg nine regions around North America, we see very congruent patterns um, in each region. On the other hand, if we actually include future species distributions in the planning process from the beginning, uh, we see that these proactive plans, these purple lines are consistently better at meeting planning goals through time. 
And that's despite substantial uncertainty on where and when species will move into future territory. And it's actually without dramatic expansion in how much habitat we have to expect, we have to protect instead, or set aside for fisheries for that matter. Instead, we, the considering future species distributions mean we set up protected areas as well as fishing zones as stepping stones so that species move out of one zone in one area, but into others, um, either further towards the poles or towards deeper depths. So I think across both of these examples, both in terms of evolution and in terms of ocean planning for fisheries and conservation, what we find is that novel conservation strategies can facilitate climate adaptation. And these kinds of considerations are not uh, being widely considered in conservation or fisheries management, though it is starting to be considered in some areas. So given the rapid changes we've already seen, I think the next several decades are going to be a key time for determining what happens to global marine ecosystems. And I think a key challenge is whether we can bring science to bear on these questions to help society make informed choices going forward. To close, there are just a couple ongoing research areas I'd like to briefly mention. The first is motivated by the observation that temporal turnover in community composition is a dominant form of biodiversity change globally. And also a key consideration if you're thinking about conservation areas, you know, what will the future composition of that area look like? But one of the things we really don't understand well yet is why some communities change composition and turn over quickly, while others change quite slowly. And especially not whether these changes are generalizable across realms or how they differ across realms. I see a question just came up. I'll, I'll address it at the end. I'm excited to get to it. So the answer to questions about turnover are likely to involve rates of environmental change, like climate, rates of temperature change, but also the structure of the communities, the traits of the component species, including whether there are lagged responses in how species respond to environmental change. Uh, there's some really exciting big data uh, opportunities here that involve integrating disparate data sources from around the world, marine, terrestrial, and, and freshwater that record how ecological communities have changed over decades across many different realms. I think that's an important part of integrating our understanding across different realms. Second, I also think we need a much better understanding for when rapid evolution helps species cope with climate change. And as I mentioned earlier, I think the cool opportunity we have here is that with historical samples, we have in effect the opportunity to rewind time by using DNA sequencing from archives. I showed you some initial research around disease and fisheries, um, but we're also uh, now starting work across 20 species of reef fishes, uh, in this case, all collected from the Philippines as part of an NSF PIRE project. So just to wrap up and summarize, we can go back to sort of this overview of how species cope with environmental variation. And you've seen a synthesis of physiological data around the world suggesting that marine ectotherms are more sensitive to warming than our animals on land. A half century of ecological surveys suggesting that marine populations respond rapidly to temperature variation, particularly through this process of range expansion and local extirpation. And it's often faster than what we see on land. And then I used to show you that mortality from a novel disease can induce rapid evolution and perhaps evolutionary rescue. But those same temporal genomics can also reveal where evolution likely is not happening, including in this textbook example of fisheries-induced evolution with the Atlantic cod. And last, I showed you two novel approaches to conservation, one to facilitate evolutionary rescue with climate change, and the other to set up networks that facilitate shifting species and help maintain both fisheries and conservation goals despite changes in uh, biogeography. And finally, throughout this talk, I've compared and contrasted climate impacts on land and at sea. And it's the same ecological and evolutionary processes that work in both realms. And yet the strategies that species use, the outcomes for populations and for communities differ in important and interesting ways. And I think more broadly, these comparisons across environments are a rich source of insight into dynamics in both realms.
So many species, uh, many people to thank, including a wonderful group of collaborators on the projects I've presented today. Uh, the stu students and postdocs in my group who make all of this fun and also the organizations that have supported our work over the years. Really, thank you for listening. Thank you so much, uh, appreciate that. And before you answer the question that's already in the chat, I'm just gonna encourage everybody who's online, if you have questions, please put them in so that we can work through them together and we'll answer them. But I'll hand it back to you, Mimi. Yeah, Donna, uh, great question. Um, yeah, there, so I don't have a, what, a great answer for you right now. Um, it's one of the things I've been wondering about. I will say that on the West Coast, uh, there's also quite a bit of uncertainty in terms of uh, the climate trajectories uh, that, were, that we were using, um, the climate projections that we were using in this, in this project. Uh, the, we're using output from a spread of global climate models, but these models are quite coarse. And so they don't resolve upwelling very well, for example, which is a key process that's determining both temperature and oxygen, future temperature and oxygen conditions on the, on the uh, West Coast continental shelf. Um, so we're both dealing with uh, so some interesting, uh, some uncertainty about the future, future changes. One of the other things, though, that I think is going on here is the spatial scale of, uh, of the planning region that we're using. We're using the whole uh, West Coast, but it's actually a very uh, relatively narrow range of temperatures. The California current quite effectively homogenizes condition, conditions, um, at least relative to the gradients we see on the West Coast. So the projected shifts in species distributions are very large. And for many of these species are actually shifting largely out of the California current region. And so uh, even uh, conservation planning or fisheries sort of zoned, zone-based planning uh, can't, can't work for species that are shifting out of the region. So that's one of the, one of the challenges on the West Coast. Thanks for the question. I was gonna kind of follow up on that, and this might be a little bit outside of um, the work that you're doing, but in our last seminar last week, we talked a little bit about um, fisheries management flexibility around climate change and how that is different when you have a state fisheries management sitting within a regional management within a you know federal management. Um, and so some of the suggestions you talked about was these stepping stones. So thinking about those different uh, management levels to have suggestions for how we think about that. Yeah, I think there's, you know, one of the important things to keep in mind is that there will be change. There's sort of unavoidable change going forward so that the, the past cannot be our only guide to what future fisheries or future fisheries management will look like. And I think that's especially true when we think about really narrow, um, at least spatially narrow zones, right? You know, we... I think it's largely infeasible to try to hold on to what has historically worked in a region. Um, and you know, we see this becoming a problem, especially around allocations. Um, so you know, on, the, on the East Coast, we're seeing cases where you, know, you might still have um, the same, same boats or at least boats from the same states going after species, but now they're traveling 500 kilometers further north past. It's a lot of fuel. It's not especially inefficient. It's not especially efficient. Um, and I think we have to instead think about ways to transition uh, area, locally based fisheries to the new species that are moving in and allow that transition to, to happen. It's definitely not easy. Um, you know, it's not easy from a technological point of view. It's not easy from a uh, social point of view uh, or in terms of permits, but that, that flexibility and helping uh, individuals and communities deal with that change and be resilient to that, that change, I think is really important. Otherwise, I think we end up really favoring those particular actors who have the capital to travel farther and adapt. You know, we're seeing, at least on the East Coast, in some cases, it's the big boats, they can travel farther, the small boats can't. Um, so if we don't help with that transition, we sort of implicitly 
switch our fisheries towards a certain certain kind of actor. We've gotten a couple questions in. Um, I'll let you catch up with them. Yeah. Okay. We've got a talk uh, question from uh, Francis. So he's curious about my take on the difference between lab and wild population responses to fisheries induced evolution. And I had noted larger population sizes, lower rates of mortality, complex responses, et cetera, that would seem to limit selection and evolution in general. But are there elements of a taxa's evolvability that are independent of a taxa's context that might explain lab versus wild differences? Uh, so another, uh, I think one of the first things that comes to mind for me is you know, some of the species that have been used in the lab, silver sides in particular come to mind, um, pick up really short generation times and non-overlapping generations. You know, that's, you know, you can remove part of the population, um, you know, leave another part of the population behind to reproduce. And, you know, very directly they're passing on their alleles to the next generation. When you have, it's quite a bit more complex when you've got overlapping generations, especially a much more longer lived species. You know, we estimate, you know, over the century or so for Atlantic cod in Norway, it was about 11 generations. Um, I think six for the 50, year, uh, 60 years or so that we had in Canada. So, you know, not many generations had passed in, in the wild. So that's a, another big difference between the lab and, um, and wild populations. And I, I think, and I, I did mention this, but I do think another important component is uh, the mechanisms of selection. You know, in, in uh, many of the experiments, sort of the simulated fishing, has nonetheless been selecting very directly on a trait. Uh, whereas in the wild, we're not selecting directly on age of maturity. It's, it's happening indirectly um, through you know, the probability of being, being caught um, and the length of time they've been in, in the wild and vulnerable to fisheries. Folks like Ken Anderson have done some nice modeling actually, um, laying that out and similarly arguing that fisheries have a Fisheries induced evolution may be quite, can happen, but may be very slow in the wild. I think so. You... There's also a question from uh, Michael Banks saying, as I recall, you mentioned that alleles found to show extreme shifts in frequencies uh, were already established variation, right? We could, we could detect those alleles even in the historical populations. Um, do you have any observations dis or discoveries to share on novel alleles that may owe to climate change or originate from, from climate change? So the, you know, it's, a, it's an interesting question. You know, the, the timescales we're talking about are, you know, especially when we're talking about generations, are Know, relatively low. And while mutations appear in a population all the time, you know, especially large populations like those in the ocean, you know, every time there's a reproductive, re reproductive events, there are somewhere in the genome, there almost certainly have been some mutations. Uh, nearly all mutations are lost in any given population, no matter how big it is, just because you know, random chance which individuals happen to survive and reproduce is, is pretty low. So the chance for a, a novel mutation to both appear and sweep towards higher frequencies over the last, you know, few decades, I think is quite low, except for in species with very short generation times. You know, the classic examples have been microbes evolving in, in labs, and I'm sure similar things are happening in the wild. I mean, we've seen it happen with COVID. We see, see it happen with HIV, right? I mean, we know evolution and novel mutation happens. I think it's going to be quite a bit less likely in the wild, except I think there, there's some really interesting cases where shifts in species distributions have led to novel hybridization or secondary contact between species. And that can lead to novel uh, introgression of alleles across former species barriers. I think, at least in my mind, that's sort of the, 
most likely source of novel genetic variation um, arising in species? So that's just my take right now, at least. That's a really interesting question. So Malin, if you're willing, I think let's try to take one last question. We have one last yeah, question from John. Yeah, uh, question from John Chapman. Um, so the latitudinal variation in marine systems, does it look the same on East Coast and West Coast? Uh, the West Coast temperature ranges are much less with latitude than the East Coast. Uh, the Alaska high is the same as the San Diego low temperature. Yeah, no, it's exactly. And historically, it's a bit tricky to compare because the historical variation we're looking at uh, is overlaying both signals from anthrop anthropogenic climate change as well as climate variability. Um, a lot of the data, actually one of the interesting things on the West Coast is a lot of the data that we've looked at has been a period of time from the 70s to the early 2000s that also overlaps with a transition from a warm PDO to a cold PDO. Um, so it's actually been a time of cooling and many species on the West Coast shifted south over that period of time. When we look at projections though, uh, so this is especially a paper that Jim Morley led, came out in 2018. Uh, we see much, uh, much more dramatic projected shifts on the West Coast of the US for exactly the reason you're talking about, right? It's a very uh, gradual temperature gradient on the West Coast. So that leads to projected shifts in species distributions of in some cases a thousand kilometers or more by the end of the century. Whereas on the East Coast, we're looking at more like 300 to 500 kilometers. So um, a big difference because in some ways the East Coast are like mountains on land. You, know, you move a little bit and you see a much cooler temperature and the West Coast is more like the plains. You've got to move a long distance to find a cooler temperature as you pointed out in your comment. Thanks a lot, good question. Thank you so much for sharing with us. Your work is fascinating. Um, for everybody online, thank you so much for joining us today. We are out of time, um, but I hope you come back and join us again next week. Uh, Malin, you can see you're getting thanks and uh, congratulations coming in thanks, for that, our virtual uh, clapping that we can do for you. So thank you very much. Um, and for everybody, again, thank you for being here. We'll see you next week. Um, and Malin, thank you for joining us and giving us your time. And hopefully we'll see you someday in the future, actually at Hatfield. I'd love to show you the new building. So thanks, everybody. Thanks a lot. We'll see everyone. Bye.